Hi, welcome to our APA's October webinar. I'm Lauren Yeti. I'm a professor of ophthalmology and pediatrics at Duke University, and I'm delighted to be here with you all tonight, including Dr. Jenny Galvin, who's the co-moderator. I want to thank the APOS online media committee for putting this educational event together tonight. We've got a great lineup of speakers. I'd also like to thank Ms. Ashley Warner from the APOS staff, who's done a lot of work to make sure that this um, comes together tonight. Uh, we have three fabulous speakers. We have Dr. Tammy Yanovich, who's going to speak about what every pediatric ophthalmologist should know about dyslexia. We've got Dr. Sarah Grace, who's got a talk entitled Pediatric Trauma Without the Drama, and Dr. Phoebe Lenhart, who will be talking to us about myopia progression with her talk entitled Slowing the Roll, Managing Myopic Progression in Children. I'll remind you to put your questions in the Q&A section, and we'd love to keep that chat going. We will have time for questions for the speakers, and I know that we have many experienced pediatric ophthalmologists in our audience tonight, and we encourage you to keep the discussion going in the Q&A box. This webinar will be recorded and will be posted later, so you'll have access to it. So without further ado, Dr. Yanovich is a clinical associate professor at the Dean McGee Eye Institute at the University of Oklahoma, and her talk is entitled, What Every Pediatric Ophthalmologist Should Know About Dyslexia. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Laura. Good evening. Thank you so much for attending this evening. I'm so excited to share this presentation, presentation with you on what every pediatric ophthalmologist should know about dyslexia. My name is Tammy Yanovich, and I'm on the APOST Learning Disabilities Committee. I have no financial interests. After attending this webinar, you will be able to describe what reading is, how children learn to read, and how dyslexia affects reading. You will also know what tests to perform to diagnose vision problems that might interfere with reading and create an effective plan to help children obtain appropriate testing and treatment for dyslexia. We'll start with a case study. A seven-year-old girl presents with her mother. She is repeating the first grade because she had difficulty learning her letters and made minimal progress in reading last year. Her teacher has recommended vision therapy, but it is not covered by their insurance. How do you help this patient? Well, the first question is, what is reading and how do children learn to read? Reading is the complex process of extracting meaning from written symbolic characters. Oral speech serves as the foundation for reading. However, there are some differences in how we learn to speak and how we learn to read. Speaking is pre-wired and develops naturally. In contrast, reading is not pre-wired and requires active learning. Therefore, it is a much more difficult skill. Reading starts with decoding. In English, we use the letters of the alphabet to represent sounds which serve as building blocks for words, there are four essential cognitive functions required to read, vision, memory, attention, and oral language skills. Vision is fundamental to reading. The visual components needed to read include visual acuity, accommodation, convergence, saccades, and fixations. There are two main actions that occur during reading, saccades and fixations. Saccades move the eyes to the next fixation point. 90% of reading time is spent fixating. The eyes gather information during fixation. Short words require one fixation. Longer words require multiple fixations. Fixation time varies depending on reading skill. When it comes to children with reading problems, a complete eye exam is necessary with special attention to near visual acuity, stereopsis, convergence, accommodation, and ocular alignment and motility. You also want to check for ocular surface issues and significant refractive error. It's important to note that many of these tests are done pre-dilation. Therefore, it's critical that you have your staff flag these patients ahead of time. We all know how to check convergence amplitudes in your point of convergence. It's also important to look at what happens with repeated convergence attempts and the ability to sustain convergence. Patients with convergence insufficiency will have a remote near point of convergence and decreased convergence amplitudes, or likely they'll have both. Alternate prism cover testing usually reveals a moderate to large exophoria or intermittent exotropia that's greater at dis at near than distance. Symptoms of convergence insufficiency include eye strain, double vision, headaches, blurred vision at near, eye fatigue, tension or pain around the eyes, print moving on the page, or frequent loss of place when reading. 
The Convergence Insufficiency Treatment Trial Attention and Reading Study has recently been completed. And this study randomized children into a treatment group where they received in-office convergence insufficiency treatment versus a sham group. And what they showed was there was improvement in the treatment group uh, in terms of near point of convergence and proximal fusional vergence, as well as a associated accommodative dysfunction. However, there was no significant difference between the treatment groups in terms of attention, reading performance, and self-reported symptoms. Accommodation is also an important uh, component of reading. Because children typically have such a good ability to accommodate, I think we often neglect checking it, but it should be checked in patients that are having reading difficulties. One of my favorite ways to evaluate this is with dynamic, dynamic retinoscopy. It is really simple. It only takes about 30 seconds. You have the patient uh, in their current spectacle correction focus on a distance target. And what you should see is with movement. And then you have them shift their focus to near and you should see that um, neutral reflex. If you still see with motion, then it is likely that they have accommodative insufficiency. There are a number of different causes of accommodative insufficiency. Um, in particular, I'd like to point out children that have Down syndrome. Also, there are certain medications and uh, children that have had head injury or concussion are more likely to have accommodative insufficiency. This slide shows the significant refractive errors in children three to four years of age as defined by the 2017 AAO Preferred Practice Pattern Guidelines. And I'd just like to emphasize that plus 1.5 diopters of hyperopia with near symptoms uh, is listed as something that should be corrected with spectacle correction. So the next question is, what is dyslexia and how does it affect reading? Dyslexia is an unexpected difficulty in reading for an individual who has the intelligence to be a much better reader. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language. And there are secondary consequences such as issues with reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that can slow the growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. Reading can be broken down into two major components, decoding and comprehension. In patients with dyslexia, they have trouble with this decoding uh, component. However, their comprehension remains intact. Here are some common warning signs of dyslexia. You should inquire um, about the absence or presence of these warning signs. In particular, I'd like to point out that because dyslexia is a language disorder, uh, typically they will present with a speech delay and they may also have trouble with rhyming. When they get older um, in elementary school age, they'll have trouble sounding out new words and possibly avoid reading. And the other point I'd like to make, I think it's really common for people to associate letter reversal with dyslexia. However, in, fa uh, in fact, poor spelling is a more common indicator of dyslexia and that typically persists throughout high school. Dyslexia impacts a young child's ability to read, spell, write, and learn. And this can lead to a sense of failure, which can trigger emotional and psychological issues that compound the problem. And so what you see over time is that there is a disparity between um, reading abilities and academic performance that increases uh, in uh, the dyslexic children versus the normal readers. How is dyslexia di uh, diagnosed and treated? Dyslexia is, and other learning disabilities are diagnosed by certified educators or neuropsychologists. They incorporate information about the patient from multiple sources and perform age-appropriate testing. It's important to realize that children can be tested at any age for dyslexia. It is not necessary for them to reach the third grade or eight years of age uh, to have this testing done. And um, children that uh, have any uh, issues with reading should be evaluated as soon as possible. Do not wait. So in terms of the pediatric ophthalmologist role, um, the number one thing to do is determine that the visual system is functioning normally. Once uh, you have ruled out any visual problems, uh, you need to assure the parents that the eyes are not 
the cause of the reading difficulty and encouraged uh, parents to seek out a formal uh, neuropsych evaluation. Um, in order to do this, they need to provide a letter in writing to their um, school if they're in public school requesting that the child be evaluated for uh, services, not necessarily specifically testing. Um, and this uh, chart here on the left just shows uh, the importance of early intervention with this problem. You can see that the percent of children reading at grade level, if they receive earlier inter intervention, is uh, almost uh, actually 90% uh, compared to 25% with later intervention. But the question is, should we be doing more? So as pediatric ophthalmologists, we're in a unique position to help these patients. Edu educators do an amazing job, but some of them might not have the background or training uh, necessary to help these kids. And uh, we have a really um, wonderful opportunity to make a huge impact if we just ask the question to all of the children that we see in our clinics if the family has any educational concerns. In addition, we can partner with our educators, administrators, and community leaders to help guide them towards um, evidence-based uh, uh, interventions and, and uh, kind of partner with them in that. Uh, I think it's really critical to not assume that once you've ruled out uh, vision problems that your job is uh, done because these families really do need um, some guidance and education and uh, uh, in particular seeking evidence-based treatment options. And then finally, remember to train your residents and fellows uh, about this issue so that they can also help their patients as well. Uh, because dyslexia is a language disorder and not a vision problem, eye tracking exercises, vision therapy, or tinted glasses do not help children uh, learn to read better or be more responsive to educational instruction. Dyslexia is treated with highly structured, explicit, intensive, systematic, multisensory language programs, and it's called the Structured liter Literacy Approach, which uh, actually is evidence-based. They've done um, controlled randomized uh, trials on these methods, and when combined with uh, the use of accommodations and technology um, can allow uh, these children access to higher level thinking and reasoning. Um, here's a couple extra resources about dyslexia. There's a wonderful podcast, The Dyslexia Buzz and Empower Dyslexia. I'd also like to mention the website Decoding Dyslexia, which provides information regarding local and state specific uh, um, directives. And it can be really helpful if you're looking for more information that is specific to your uh, region or part of the country. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And we can take questions now or later. Thanks, Tammy. That was great. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, Dr. Friedman asked about accommodative function, which I think you sort of addressed in terms of using dynamic retinoscopy to measure accommodative insufficiency. I also asked about accommodative facility in reading problems and noted that as pediatric ophthalmologists, we're not taught very well how to, um, how to measure, how to diagnose and treat these problems. Did you have any other, more, any other comments on accommodation as it relates to dyslexia? Um, so there's a couple other tests um, that I didn't mention. Uh, one is where you can actually use flippers and they're plus one and a half diopters on one side and then minus one and a half diopters on the other. And you present that to the patient with a near target and they should be able to kind of comfortably transition between those two uh, pretty easily without a lot of strain or fatigue. And if they're noting um, issues with that, then you know I would say they might be having some accommodative issues. Um, and then the other easy kind of uh, thing to do to check uh, accommodative um, ability is uh, put them behind the four opter and have them focus on a. Uh, 
a near uh, target uh, with like minus two over their uh, refraction. And if they have trouble with that, then um, they may have accommodative issues. But that's, a, you're absolutely right. We do not train our residents very well in terms of checking accommodation. Those are, those are great tips. Thanks so much. Um, there was also a comment about asking about family history. Does dyslexia run in families? Absolutely, family history is a, a, a number one indicator. And so um, typically uh, these patients will have a family history. I didn't mention that, but that's a good point. Yeah, I think that is a great point. And one question asks, do you refer to the Shaywitz research in discussing dyslexia with parents? And I'm, I am not familiar. I don't know what exactly the Shaywitz research is, and I'm not sure if you know what that so is. So Sally Shaywitz is like the guru of dyslexia, and she did a lot of the um, research and studies. Um, I think it was in the New England area, and um, she wrote a wonderful book called Overcoming Dyslexia. And if you're looking for really good, solid information, um, I think that is an excellent resource. And I do recommend that my parents uh, that have children with dyslexia uh, either read that book or uh, sometimes it's easier for them to listen to it if the, they do have a history of dyslexia themselves. <laughs> um, I know that uh, makes it a little bit easier now that we have audiobook access. And I know that the committee that you're on has lots of resources available for us. Can you give us some other um, places, you know, that we might find resources for parents and for ourselves? Sure, and the APOST Learning Disability Committee has some wonderful brochures and handouts that you can actually um, go online and, and purchase. And I use uh, those quite often uh, to give to my uh, patients that are having issues. And then I'd also just like to plug, we do a longer workshop at the annual meeting for the Academy and at APOST. And if you are interested in learning more about these techniques or more about kind of the uh, pathophysiology and neurobiology of all of this, uh, then I would love to have you guys come to that uh, because uh, we dig even deeper into this important issue. Well, I think that was a great summary. I appreciate everything that um, the Learning Disabilities Committee for APOS has done to get us all up to speed. These are difficult conversations and families are really desperate, which is probably why they go after some of the unproven therapies. So thanks so much for that. And thank you to the committee. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sarah Grace. She's a clinical associate um, I'm sorry, Dr. Sarah Grace is a pediatric ophthalmologist and a strabismus specialist at the North Carolina Eye, Ear, Nose, and Throat Hospital. Her title is Pediatric Trauma Without the Drama, which is a great title. Thank you, Dr. Grace. Thank you, Dr. Nyeri, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for participating in the webinar. And tonight, I'll be discussing some current topics in pediatric eye trauma as well as the management of pediatric eyelid lacerations and hyphema. So I have no financial disclosures. There we go. And so I'm gonna start off with a timely discussion about trends in pediatric ocular trauma during the COVID-19 pandemic. As both a pediatric ophthalmologist and a mother of young children, I can attest to the st statistic that home is the most common setting for eye injuries in children. With stay-at-home orders and mandated school closing, there is a significant potential for increased ocular injuries in children. So what happened? In many areas of the world, emergency room visits were decreased by roughly half in the earliest stages of the pandemic, with the largest decrease in children 14 years of age or younger. Eye emergency visits overall were decreased as well. However, a study specific to pediat pediatric patients in a busy eye emergency room at a large academic center showed that um, while overall pediatric emergency visits mirrored the national decrease, the visits for pediatric ocular trauma showed a disproportionately smaller decrease of only 34% compared to pre-pandemic. Injury type compared to pre-pandemic was similar in some aspects, such as chemical injuries being the most common in very young children, but differed in others in that open globes occurred more often in older children compared to prior studies, which report them more frequently in the preschool age. Additionally, boys had just slightly more injuries than girls compared to the typically much higher rate that males have of open globe injuries in the literature. 
A unique form of eye trauma has emerged during the pandemic in the form of ocular burns from alcohol-based hand sanitizers, which I'll call ABHS. A group in France working with the French Poison Control Center found a seven-fold increase in hand sanitizer-related eye injuries compared to pre-pandemic. The number of cases rose sharply after lockdown ended and children began to enter public places again. There are similar reports from other countries. Small children seem especially vulnerable to this injury because they stand at the right height to accidentally spray alcohol from a freestanding dispenser directly into their eyes, like you see with that little girl in the check dress. Some may also accidentally rub the sanitizer into their eyes after applying it to their hands, but that's usually a lower dose. The ability of alcohol to disrupt the corneal epithelium is intentionally used in some forms of refractive surgery, and this uses 20% ethanol solutions, and they're used for a maximum of 30 seconds. Alcohol-based hand sanitizers usually contain a minimum of the recommended 60% alcohol, with the WHO recommending either 75% isopropanol or 80% ethanol. Fortunately, most cases of ABHS ocular exposure are mild with symptoms of pain, tingling, and just conjunctival hyperemia. There are a few cases though, like this one, of more severe injury. Ethanol not only has an immediate cytotoxic effect on corneal epithelial cells, but it also reduces proliferation and induces apoptosis of those cells. The sanitizers can also contain irritant additives like hydrogen peroxide, polyethylene glycol to increase viscosity, perfumes or essential oils, which can increase the ABHS ocular toxicity. So this is a case published of a child that presented two days after getting hand sanitizer in their eye. A presentation in figure A, you just see that the eye is red and that's the only sign of the underlying corneal and epithelial lesions um, and of the conjunctiva as well that you see here with all the staining. So 12 days after the splatter, despite an amniotic membrane transplantation performed at day two, the cornea was not completely re-epithelialized and this patient required another amniotic membrane suture. So the treatment of these injuries overall is pretty basic. Immediately after the injury, copious irrigation is needed and gentle swabbing of the fornices if there's concern for residual viscous chemical gel. Ocular surface friendly topical antibiotics like moxifloxacin or erythromycin can be used if there's significant epithelial defects or punctate keratopathy and the risk for a secondary infection. Steroids can be used in cases with a lot of inflammation and preservative free artificial tears as well. Amniotic membrane, membrane transplants may be used in severe cases with complete corneal epithelial loss or those not responding to more conservative treatment. And of course, the best strategy is prevention, which is tricky when any room you walk into these days has hand sanitizer in it. Hand washing on very young kids instead of sanitizer can be helpful. Education and placing sanitizer dispensers below children's eye level are a couple good ideas. Well, now I'm gonna completely switch gears and focus on pediatric eyelid lacerations, a complex issue with many layers, no pun intended. When a child comes in with a laceration, the history of injury will give some clues as to what structures may be involved. Dog bites, for example, are an evulsive and tearing type of force, which is more likely to injure the canalicular system. With sharp penetrating injuries like scissors, box cutters, or drone blades, injuries are usually deeper and can have penetration of the orbital septum. Patients with deep eyelid lacerations are more likely to have ocular injuries as well. These patients should receive intraoperative antibiotics, and they should be sent home on about a week's course of PO antibiotics that has good coverage like Augmentin. It's also very important to know where a child is in their tetanus vaccine schedule, and if their immunizations are incomplete or if their booster is more than five years ago, they should get a repeat dose. Lastly, it's just good to set expectations with the family about what they may expect after surgery. Will there be delayed healing? Will they need later correction of ptosis? Will the child have a stent in place that'll need to be removed? Assessing the wound extent is easiest under anesthesia. After dried blood has been removed before infiltrating with lidocaine and epi, and you may wanna close deeper lesions with a few interrupted sutures. The presence of orbital fat implies a breach of the septum, 
indicating possible damage to the underlying levator muscle and the need to explore the levator complex either through the laceration or through a separate upper eyelid crease incision and close deeper wounds with interrupted vicral sutures. Lastly, a bit on the repair of marginal lid lax. To approximate the tarsus, a buried vertical mattress technique works well using a 60 vicral suture on an S29. The remainder of the tarsus can then be approximated horizontally with partial thickness simple interrupted six or seven ovicral sutures, the lash line then aligned with another simple interrupted six ovicral suture aiming for good aversion, and then skin closure with either seven ovicral or fast absorbing gut suture. When you have a marginal lid laceration with suspected canaliculer involvement, identifying the nasal portion of the lacerated canaliculus is often the most difficult part of the surgery. Some useful tools for identifying the cut canaliculus are using air under BSS, fluorescein, viscoelastic, or the pigtail catheter, and the use of these various techniques is well described in the literature. Once you identify your cut ends, use the stent most appropriate to the case and your level of comfort, as there's many great choices for stents these days. Lastly, a brief bit on hyphema to just reinforce some of the more salient points. If there's no history of blunt trauma, the usual mechanism for a hyphema in children, be wary of diseases that can cause spontaneous hyphema like juvenile xanthogranuloma or retinoblastoma. Also remember that sickle cell trait patients have similar complications to those of children with sickle cell disease. Over the past decades, treatment has shifted from inpatient to outpatient without significant increase in rebleeds or other complications. As AIO guidelines suggest, many ophthalmologists recommend limited activity and prescribe topical steroids and cycloplegics, though there's no clear evidence to support this. There is a broad range of rebleed rates reported in the literature, with a range from around 5 to 40 percent, and they typically occur within a few days after the injury. There is no standardized treatment algorithm for ocular hypertension in pediatric hyphema patients. Important factors to consider are sickle cell status, concomitant ocular disease, and the pressure of the fellow eye for comparison. Timolol is generally a good first choice for acetazolamide, as long as sickle cell status is negative, and that generally goes for oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors as well. Bromonidine should be avoided in very young children due to the ability to cause CNS depression. Thankfully, only about 5% of patients with hyphema end up requiring surgery despite maximum medical therapy. Surgery is indicated when IOP is uncontrolled, there's corneal blood staining, a pressure greater than 25 in a child with sickle cell disease, and the persistence of a large or total hyphema or active bleeding that can't be controlled. The most common first procedure is the AC washout with filtering procedures usually reserved for those who fill multiple washouts. For uncomplicated hyphemas, there is a high chance for a good visual recovery, with the majority of children improving within a month of the injury and some showing recovery beyond that. Risk factors for lower visual recovery are size of presenting hyphema in addition to the presence or development of other complications like rebleeds, elevated intraocular pressure, and injury to other ocular structures. The degree and duration of obstruction of the visual access is also important to consider very young children in the amblyogenic age range. Also, up to 85% of patients have angle recession. It's important to educate parents that their child is at a lifelong risk of increased eye pressure due to their injury and they require at least annual eye exams. These are the reference I use for this talk and thank you so much for your attention tonight. That was great, Sarah. Thank you so much um, for that. Your talk was super clear and there's not um, a lot of comments coming into the, a lot of questions coming in. I think we're all just traumatized thinking about our um, call experiences. Do you have any tips for getting kids to wear safety glasses? Mm, no, no personal tips other than just modeling them. Like my husband and I wear them a lot at home when we do stuff around the house. And I talk about eye safety a lot with patients and a lot with parents. There's always just good opportunities to bring up when you're asking a kid, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do? Oh, do you, you wear eye protection when you play soccer and those sorts of things. I think we can all just do a really good job in the community modeling that for our patients and getting people thinking about it 
just through education, not necessarily sharing horror stories, but just being advocates for eye safety out there. Yeah, I think that's a really, a really great point. Um, well, thank you so much for that um, talk. I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator, Dr. Galvin, to introduce our last speaker. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ayeti. Great job. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Phoebe Lenhart. She is an associate um, clinical professor of ophthalmology at Emory, and her, the title of her talk is Slowing the Roll, Managing Myopic Progression in Children. Good evening, everyone. My name is Phoebe Lenhart, and I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about slowing the roll, managing myopic progression in children. I have no financial interest to disclose, but I will be discussing an off-label use of atropine eye drops. The goals of this brief talk are to describe the worldwide myopia epidemic and to compare various treatment strategies for prevention of myopia progression in children. I'll also provide some current resources where you can find more information to share with your patients and communities. By 2050, there will be 3 billion more people with myopia and 775 million more with high myopia than in 2000. This myopic progression is occurring in all ethnic groups with slightly higher rates in children of East or Southeast Asian descent, depending on age. One study by Long and co-authors involved real world analysis of a large racially and ethnically diverse cohort of nearly 12,000 patients in Southern California. These children were between the ages of four and 11 years old and had documented refraction between minus one and minus four. Figure A to the left here shows refractive error by years of follow-up with the black line indicating the trajectory for white children and the red line for Eastern Southeastern Asian children. Figure B to the right shows refractive error by age and years. You can see that East Southeast Asian children differed in terms of their overall trajectory from white children in terms of decline in uh, spherical equivalent. What's more, in some countries in Asia, the incidence of myopia exceeds 80%. Risk factors for myopic progression include genetics, earlier age of onset, and increased screen time or time spent on near work. According to the Comet study published in Ophthalmology in 2007, children with two myopic parents or who had higher baseline myopia were more likely to develop high myopia. With regards to age of onset, work by WHO and co-authors has shown that each year of delay in onset age significantly reduces the chances of developing myopia. A study published in 2021, evaluating nearly 35 years of data from school children in Taiwan, shows that working distance and electronic device use contribute to the development of myopia. This may explain why the prevalence of myopia increases with higher levels of education. Some of the long-term sequelae of increased axial length in childhood and adolescence include myopic maculopathy and retinal detachment. But odds ratios for other diseases um, relative to emetropia are higher as well for patients with myopia, for example, posterior subcapsular cataract and glaucoma. This in turn leads to the problem that ultimately more patients with myopic maculopathy will lead to a much higher global burden of visual impairment and blindness. So what can be done to slow this seemingly inexorable role of progressive myopia in children? The tool chest of treatment options for progressive myopia in children includes behavioral, pharmacologic and optical interventions. And it's possible to combine these approaches to treatment to best address the needs of a given patient or family. So I'd like to poll the audience here to see how many people are currently using some method of slowing myopic progression in their practice. You can just reply yes or no for now. Okay, now I'd like to ask you which form. A, a behavioral strategy. Okay, so it looks like about 83% of the audience here is um, using some form of slowing my, myopia progression in their practice, and about 17% said no. And now I'd like to ask you which form, um, those, are you, those of you who are using one are using, A, a behavioral strategy, um, such as outdoors time or limiting near work, 
um, B, low dose atropine, C, optical, multifocal contact lenses, orthokeratology, or D, a combination of strategies. Okay, and it looks like um, a combination of strategies is the winner here with about 57% of people um, using some of the above. Um, behavioral and low dose atropine um, being the main ones. Not many people um, selected multifocal contact lenses or orthokeratology. So that sets the stage um, for what I'm about to talk about. Um, some of you might also be thinking, when is the best time to intervene? So myopia may progress rapidly between the ages of five and 15 years. So children in this age group who present with significant myopic progression over six to 12 months may be some of the best candidates for intervention as axial length changes once they occur are irreversible. Behavioral interventions, interventions to slow the progression of myopia include increasing time spent outdoors, increasing reading distance and taking frequent reading breaks. While near work has been shown to contribute to the development of myopia, and high myopia, time spent outdoors has been shown to be protective. Sherwin and co-authors conducted a meta-analysis that showed more time spent outdoors, about an hour a day or about seven hours a week, um, reduces the risk of myopia and myopia progression. Interestingly, a recent paper found that myopia in young adulthood was most strongly associated with recent 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations, which is a marker of time spent outdoors. A Taiwanese study found increasing reading distance to greater than 30 centimeters and taking breaks from reading at least every 30 minutes to be protective against myopic progression in 10,000 students. Public health approaches to incorporating these behavioral interventions have included prototype natural light classrooms like this one in China. Pharmacologic agents can also slow the progression of myopia. The results of the atropine for the treatment of myopia or ADAM and the LAMP studies have shown that low-dose atropine slows myopic progression in Asian populations. While atropine is known to be a muscarinic antagonist, its exact mechanism of action in slowing the progression of myopia remains unknown. It's believed that atropine acts directly or indirectly on the retina or sclera, inhibiting thinning or stretching of the sclera and thereby eye growth. Briefly, the results of the ADAM-1 and ADAM-2 studies are shown here. Decreasing spherical equivalent is on the y-axis, while progression of time up to 60 months or five years is on the x-axis. The different lines are different concentrations of atropine, while the line with the empty triangle is shown here taking a nosedive as the placebo group. In the treatment groups, there was a dose-dependent response to topical low-dose atropine. At 24 months, shown by the vertical dotted line here, treatment stopped for all groups in the ADAM-1 study. Myopia had slowed by 80% in the atropine 1% group and 60% in the 0.01% group. There was then a washout period shown between the two vertical dotted lines here during which greater rebound myopia was noted in the higher atropine concentrations. Then in the ADAM-2 study, which started here and to the right, Three lower doses of atropine were compared, 0.1%, 0.05%, and 0.01%. At five years, 0.01% atropine eye drops were more effective in slowing myopia progression with less visual side effects compared with higher doses of atropine. The LAMP study was done to evaluate the efficacy and safety of three relatively lower doses of atropine drops, 0.05%, 0.025%, and 0.01%. The study showed that over two years, the efficacy of 0.05%, which are the blue lines um, shown here, uh, observed was double that observed with 0.01% atropine, and it remained the concentration of choice among the studied atropine concentrations in slowing myopia progression. Any accommodation loss or change in pupil size was reportedly well tolerated in all low concentration atropine groups in the LAMP study. But it's important to remember that um, Choosing the concentration necessitates a balance between efficacy and tolerability. Furthermore, because low-dose atropine formulations must at this time be compounded, they can be difficult and costly to obtain. There are several ongoing pharmaceutically-led low-dose atropine clinical trials underway and in phase three studies with expected completion dates between 2022 and 2025. Some optical managements for prog progressive myopia are multifocal soft contact lenses, orthokeratology and spectacle lenses. 
These optical management options are centered on the concept of correcting peripheral retinal hyperopic defocus. Now bear with me here. In the following images, the blue arc shown here is where the image is falling. Once the eye elongates in myopia, optical images from spherical lenses no longer fall on the retinal plane. The peripheral images are out of focus, falling on a plane behind the retina. Current thinking is that the relative hyperopic error created is the stimulus for axial elongation. With traditional correction, a monofocal distance lens moves the image back to the retinal plane, but peripheral um, hyperopic defocus still exists. Current optical treatments to slow the progression of myopia move the peripheral focus in front of the retina, thus removing the stimulus for axial elongation. Chamberlain et al. looked at myopia in children eight to 12 years with spherical equivalent refraction of minus 0.75 diopters to minus four diopters as part of a 36 month randomized, controlled, uh, randomized clinical trial. Subjects received either MySight monofocal, excuse me, multifocal contact lenses or ProClear monofocal contact lenses. The multifocal lens myopic progression and reduced the rate of axial growth as shown here. There was an unadjusted change in spherical equivalent refraction of nearly three quarters of a diopter less in the multifocal group compared with the control group. Orthokeratology is another management option. It involves the gas permeable contact lenses every night to reshape the cornea. Its exact mechanism is not understood, but it's possible that this corneal reshaping changes the peripheral focus of the eye to reduce myopia progression. The American Academy of Ophthalmology's Ophthalmology Technology Assessment Committee recently reviewed 13 studies with a primary outcome of change in uh, axial length or refraction and found that ortho-K typically reduced axial elongation by approximately 50% over a two-year study period. They concluded that ortho-K may be effective in slowing myopic progression for children and adolescents with a potentially greater effect when initiated at an earlier age, about six to eight. They did find, however, that rebound can occur after discontinuation of orthokeratology and noted that safety remains a concern due to the risk of potentially blinding microbial keratitis associated with the contact lens wear. So what else can be done on a larger scale to slow the role of progressive myopia in children? The American Academy of Ophthalmology's task force on myopia recommends focusing on education, increasing screening efforts to catch young myopes, increasing outdoor exposure, and taking frequent reading breaks. The rule of thumb is the so-called 20-20-20 rule. Kids should take a 20-second 20, 20 break after every 20 minutes or more of near work and spend 20 seconds looking at a distant object at least 20 feet away. Here are some additional resources that may be of benefit to you and your patients. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Lenhart. That was an outstanding talk. Um, there are um, some questions um, here from the chat. Um, Dr. Ellen Miller um, asked a question about any news from glasses with a peripheral blur that help decreasing myopia progression availability in the US? Um, they, they hear that they're available in Canada and Europe. Yes, um, there are um, different spectacle lenses that are um, uh, under study at this time. Um, and some of those are DIMS, um, Stellest, and Sight Glass. Um, so if you're interested in um, looking at those, um, I didn't go into much detail about this because we don't have a lot of experience um, with these lenses at this point in time. Thank you. Another question asks that um, how, if there was a teenager um, who is example 16, who is already a minus six or a minus seven, is that too late um, for treatment? Um. Um, I don't believe so. Um, you know, I don't think we really know when the ideal time to start treatment is. Um, these, you know, atropine is mainly used for typical juvenile onset myopia. Um, so I think that any um, child falling in that age range of five to 15 years um, is a pretty good time to start treatment. Um, I think it's mainly, you know, the patient's with very high levels of myopia um, from a very early age, possibly associated with other pathologies and other mechanisms of myopic progression that we know less about. 
No, that's an excellent point. I agree. Um, Dr. David Wallace has um, asked, why do you think short breaks from reading are beneficial in reducing myopia progression? And of the same sort of question, Dr. James McDonald says, is there research to support the 2020 rule that we often are recently quoting from AAO? Um, you know, my understanding is that um, taking short reading breaks by um, looking at horizon lines that are further away um, relaxes our accommodation, um, but I, I can't claim to be an expert in, in this area. I'd be interested to know if other audience um, members know more about this than I do. Um, some other um, uh, questions that um, that are asking about if you when you start treatment, do you also check the axial length um, or just the change in refraction? I know myself personally, I do monitor yearly axial length um, um, as, as well, just in accordance with the studies that you had had mentioned. Um, I think it's a good idea if you have access to an instrument that can measure axial length um, to do that. Um, you know, at least on an annual basis, if you're going to be treating with low dose atropine. Great questions here. Um, um, one question also from Dr. Simon is how long should the atropine treatment continue and what age should it be stopped? That's, that's I don't think anyone knows the answer to those questions yet. Um, but um, I would say that from People that I um, know, um, I think most people are using it for a year or two and, um, you know, then maybe trying a trial um, off of the medication. Um, but as, you know, we've discussed, there can be some rebound um, decline, unfortunately, on stopping the medicine, less so with the 0.01 in the lower concentrations than with higher concentrations. Mm -hmm. um, but we just don't know how much uh, people would rebound over what period of time. And therefore, the ideal length of treatment remains unknown. Um, we don't know if this is something we're going to have to keep children on until they're 17 or 18 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, I think that is the hardest thing in terms of talking to patients' parents. Um, we can't really give them a clear idea of how long they'll be needing to pay for this medicine, um, not only the difficulties of obtaining it, but how long they're going to need to be using it. No, I agree. I agree in terms of it was very beneficial for some of the studies to have a washout period, but then in the applicability to our practices makes it um, complex. Um, uh, another, this was an anonymous question, but um, they, um, they asked, um, can using bifocals eliminate accommodation to reduce the progression of myopia? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Can using bifocals eliminate accommodation reduce the progression of myopia? Um, that has not been shown to be very effective. Um, it's more of the um, multifocal glasses, lenses, and um, contact lenses that can provide that peripheral retinal hyperopic defocus. And then one question in particular about ortho K, the question is from Dr. DeCastro um, Abiger, is the standard ortho K lens or specifically adapted for peripheral defocus? Is it um, adapted for peripheral defocus, the, the standard one? Uh, well, it has, it has a reverse um, geometry in terms of its fit. Um, that I showed, I believe, in that um, diagram, you know, of how the lens fits. And so it's thought that this may create some peripheral retinal hyperopic defocus um, in its reshaping of the cornea. Thank you. Um, no, I think, yeah, thank you so much. I think there are a lot of outstanding um, questions and even comments on your um, talk. And this is a, um, a very important topic and we're very grateful for you to bring um, us into the forefront, Dr. Um, Lenhardt, thank you so much. Thank you for all the great questions and thank you for listening and attending this evening. Of course, yeah. Um, there were a couple follow-up questions. If we want to get all the panelists back on, um, there were some questions for Dr. Grace about trauma. So Dr. Sprunger said um, that he's also seen several children with corneal abrasions from hand sanitizers and was curious about your thoughts on using tight pressure patches for epithelial defects. Yeah. Um, I know some people do use those a lot and find that they work well. I myself don't do much pressure patching. 
Um, I'm typically a, you know, goop the eye up with ointment kind of person, but I also do really like a bandage contact lens in the right patient and the right parent. And I know they're going to get, you know, well taken care of and they're going to get their antibiotic eye drops in over the bandage contact lens and they're going to come back and see me in about two days. Um, so I myself like bandage contact lenses, but I can definitely see the appropriateness of a patch and follow up. Um, but yeah, I, I had no idea that this was happening. I mean, I'm sure we've all rubbed our eyes after sanitizing our hands so many times in a day. Um, but I had a patient just last week and he had this really impressive um, conjunctival epithelial presentation. I think he'd had corneal and he'd come in like two days later and it was kind of small and was really focal there temporally. It's, it was pretty impressive. So it made me interested in looking into it. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is if you do do a pressure bandage, one thing that Sharon Friedman taught me is using Tegaderm to keep the eye closed is um, really great, works a lot better for me than tape, and that there's also collagen um, shield contact lenses that are dissolvable if you're perhaps if you were in the OR and could get a collagen shield in but don't want to have to deal with taking it out, that could also be um, a good one. And Occasionally, I've had patients that have epithelial defects at the end of strabismus surgery. Not my fault, resident's fault, of course. And uh, collagen shield can be helpful in that situation as well for the patient's comfort. Um, Dr. Goldman asked about your um, thoughts on using Amicar for hyphemas. Yeah. So thankfully, I've never been confronted with that choice or had to use it myself. Um, I was reading a little bit about that more recently. There's a big meta-analysis of a Cochrane review uh, from 2019 where they looked at the data for antifibrinolytics and kind of what they found was that both topical and systemic decrease rebleeds, um, but there's the numbers are small. And so it's kind of hard to tell what their effect is on all the other things we worry about it with. Like, high eye pressure, corneal blood staining, posterior synechiae. Um, and they do certainly make the hyphemas much slower to clear. Um, but in the big Cochrane review, there weren't a lot of systemic side effects and they weren't necessarily worse in the systemic group like you might expect. So for those, um, I'd be so interested to hear from people who do use antifibrinolytics often who are dealing with, you know, the more aggressive hyphemas and the more aggressive um, glaucoma cases that come from these and what they feel like the role is in it. I haven't used Amacar since I was um, a resident. That was back in the olden days. I don't know if anyone else on the panel has experience with that. One other question about myopia. Um, this is maybe to all the panelists, but first to Dr. Lenhart. Um, they're wondering, are most of the, uh, the pediatric ophthalmologists using dilute atropine 0.01% or 0.05%? Uh, that's a good question. Um, personally, I use 0.01% um, still. Um, a pediatric optometr optometrist in our practice, though, has been using the 0.025% um with uh good results and um no reported um significant side effects i'll open it up to the rest of the panels dr ayeri and dr grace and dr yanvich um how about yourselves as well um typically use 0.01 me too me me three yeah same mm -hmm. I, I have switched and then I switched the summer after the lamp study and I did have quite a few patients that had the light sensitivity um, and even though they weren't responding well to the 0.01% um, that I went back um, because of the light sensitivity and not being able to tolerate the 0.05%. 
I think there's a, certainly a lot of interest in this area. And you can see from all the questions in the chat, a lot of us have the same questions. You know, how long do we keep patients on it and how to apply their research studies to patients who don't quite fit? I had a patient with Down syndrome who was a minus 12 today who someone else had put on atropine. And, you know, the question is in this little kid, is it going to do anything? Can you even apply the study? So I think there's lots of questions still to be explored. And all of us are, are trying to figure these things out. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Yes. Well, thank you so much um, for all of our participants. I think we had nearly, um, you know, 90 um, of APOS members participating and this outstanding panelists. Um, and thank you, Dr. Ayeti, you're doing a great job as moderator. Um, on behalf of the online media committee, I'm Jenny, I'm Dr. Jenny Galvin, and one of our roles is behind the scenes to help run the webinars. And so I'm really grateful to um, the panelists um, and for sharing your knowledge and content this evening. And then thank you, Ashley from APOS. Um, are we ready to wrap up? Is that right? I think we're all set for tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us all. Take care and stay safe during the pandemic. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.